From the EPR Creation Studio, this is Jason Staples, bringing you another episode of Unconquered with Doc Staples. Talking 0-3 Florida State, and uh, revisiting a little bit of the Memphis Memphis game, which, uh, as uh, I mentioned afterwards, was a really a turd you can't polish. No polish in that one, and quite frankly... Uh, I went back and did the the film review, and I only did the uh, the the condensed game version of it, uh, partly because I knew I would have a little bit more trouble uh, keeping it in the short range with the with the longer one, given the way that this game went. And quite honestly, it was worse than I expected. Um, you know, I oftentimes will take you know two or three, four watches of a of a given game. This one, I went back more cold. And you can kind of hear me at different points responding to what I'm seeing in real time, as opposed to having uh, taken a look at it uh, beforehand. And yeah, it's no bueno, guys. Uh, there's some there's some stuff on the offensive line that is deeply concerning. Honestly, uh, I, I want to be clear: Alex Atkins, Gabe Fertitta, you know Cooper. These guys are all smart coaches who know what they're doing, and you know, they're, they're, I mean, these are, these are not incompetent men. I have no idea. I am baffled at the product that's being put out there on offense right now on the offensive line. I'm talking about third year guys like, uh, like, you know, you've got a, you've got an offensive tackle out there, Jalen early. He's a third year guy. He should be at least fundamentally sound at this point. You know, basically, ba- you know, basic things. Get a good pass set, stay square in your pass set, pass off, twist game correctly, different things like that. You know, proper hand placement. So if a guy attacks your inside shoulder, you, you, you know, you punch this way versus this way. All Post up on the inside leg and this way. All sorts of different things there. And I, I'm just, I'm amazed by what what we saw there in terms of the fundamentals and he was by far the only from he was far from the only one and i don't understand why they're not gaining ground on some of the vertical plays like like inside zone some of those things there's just a whole lot of why right now up front and i i don't have a lot of answers on why it is the way that it is but it's not good enough, and I don't know how you get much better at that in season if it hasn't been drilled and the fundamentals haven't been pushed beyond that. Um, and I'm talking about the, the things. The thing is, I'm talking about guys that have been in the program for a long time. I'm not talking about the immediate transfers. You know, Richie Leonard, Terrence Ferguson. That's a whole different, whole different issue. But yeah, I. There's got to be some ser- serious work done at those spots or, you know, you're, you're not looking at a whole lot of winnable games on the schedule because you're not going to be able to block people. In any case, for the rest of the show, I'm primarily going to be addressing some uh, some questions. This is mostly a mailbag episode. So, uh, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get to that. Before I do that, I want to uh, thank my sponsors. As always, podcast brought to you by EPR Creations, bringing you the best of internet marketing and website development for an affordable price. And by Luis Marquez of Momentum Realty in Jacksonville, Florida. As always, Luis trained in uh, photography, pro- professionally trained in photography and videography. It's going to make your place look the absolute best it can. You will get top dollar if you if you uh, hire Lewis to list your house in the greater Jacksonville area. Let him know you heard about him from the Unconquered podcast. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to some uh, some mailbag stuff here. So uh, the first one is uh, here. Um, this one's from from Twitter, actually. Uh, serious questions. One, is DJ Uyunglele the worst starting quarterback in Division I football? Uh, no, actually, he's not close. And this is one of the most concerning things, honestly, about what I've seen when I've gone back and I've looked at the film. Is DJ has not been the worst part 
of Florida State's offense. In fact, he's been one of the better and more consistent parts of the offense. There's some really bad misses and some decisions that he's making in the pre-snap right now and immediate post-snap that I do not understand, you know, running into into heavy boxes when you've got an RPO in the outside, different things like that. But he's not been the worst part of the offense. That's that's the deeply concerning thing. Now, I still think this week you 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 should if you don't start him, you at least have to have Brock Glenn get snaps in this game to find out what you have in, in, in a live setting. Now I, I actually, you know, I, and I said, I changed my opinion uh, between recording the hot takes and later that evening. I, I, on the hot takes episode, I was, I was pretty clear uh, that I was not in a rush necessarily. It was not an immediate, okay, you've got to get DJU out of there a uh, little bit more of a moderate position of, well, you know, you've got to assess everything, you know, one or two more conference losses and then it's a mandatory. And then afterwards I, I made the, I kind of came around on that. And I, I said, you know what? Uh, that's, I disagree with myself. <laughs> I think, I think they've got to make the switch. And the reason that they've got to make the switch, uh, there, there are actually several different reasons that they've got to make the switch. And, uh, and that's number one, I think the, Offense, ha- offenses take uh, take on the personality to some degree of their of their quarterback, and DJ plays at such a sort of slow pace and slow sense of you know general lack of urgency, just in terms of body language and everything else, to such a degree that I think you have to be very careful. Uh, about how that's going to work for your overall offense. And, you know, frankly, my, my take is if nothing else, you've got to, you've got to start to think about the rhythm and the tempo of the offense. Uh, And at this point it's running at DJ's pace. And is, and do you change that up beyond that? I think having a quarterback who presents a, a running threat on the edge. So DJ is actually a pretty good run, runner in between the tackles and, and did did some things with his legs there against Memphis. But the ability to have a little bit of escapability, given what's happening right now on the offensive line, is not the worst idea in the world either. Uh, the other thing is that I think you have to learn what you have for 2025 sooner than later. You need to know whether or not you're really going to need to go and get another portal quarterback. You know, is Glenn not progressing to the point where you 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 feel like he's an obvious heir apparent for next year. If not, you need to know that because you need to know that you're going to have to go and probably spend a million dollars or plus to get a quality quarterback in the portal. Uh and yeah, I, I know Luke Cromenhook is there as well. I I think a second year Cromenhook, he came in fairly raw. You know, I I Again, if if I was going to go in next year expecting him to be the starter, I'd want to know based on some stuff this year as well. And I, I just think I think they need to know. Uh, I think at this point the season's kind of tanked in terms of your main goals, and you've got to figure out what you're going to be next year. Uh, then the line of scrimmage checks also poor, and I think when you're looking at a at a vet who's making some of the mistakes that are being made, might as well have young guys m- make those mistakes. And, and then you're looking at potential spark. You never know how that's going to go P- based on practice. That's probably unlikely, but you never know. And then the final thing is if the young quarterback does start playing well earlier in the season, that does help recruiting going, going forward and helps regain some momentum in that respect. So those are some of the things that, that had me changing my opinion on some of that uh, since the, the last time uh, I, I talked on the, on the podcast. But in any case, that still brings us back. DJ has not been the worst starting quarterback in division one football and hasn't been close. Uh, He's not been great. And, you know, you haven't won with him, but he's, he's actually been, if the, if I'll say this, if you'd had a viable running game through the first three, three games, you probably win all three. But when you can't block anybody, that makes it worse. And as we talked about on the, on the hot takes podcast, DJ just, He's a force multiplier, one direction or, or another. And if you can't block, it's not, he's he's going to make you worse. 
And if he can block, he's going to make you just moderately better, right? So um, that's just the way it is. All right, uh, next question. Is Mike Norvell capable of building a national championship caliber program at FSU moving moving forward from here? And my answer to that is I believe yes, absolutely. Uh, Mike Norvell has not forgotten how to coach. And, you know, he's not a broken man. This is not, you know, post, uh, you know, post Jacobs, uh, Taylor Jacobs, Jimbo Fisher. This is not, it's not a similar situation. So um, this is a situation where I think some bad evaluations were made and and a few other things just culturally made this a very difficult year. Uh, and I think some stuff with the staff has to get resolved, but I have all, all the confidence. And again, this is a guy with enormous respect within the coaching community. He's going to be able to hire top level guys at this point. Uh, and, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions again about, you know, is he really going to be willing to make these moves without his hands being forced? And I'm telling you, he will be. I know a couple of years ago, he reached out to a couple of upgrades at assistant coach. And at the time, the thought was that he was on the hot seat and, you know, he might not be there another year. And a couple of those guys basically responded of like, yeah, you know, I'm not sure about the job security. And, you know, so they passed and he stayed pat. He kept the guys on staff that he had. But the thing is, he's not going to. He's and I talked about this on the podcast back then. I, I you know sort of in code, but I mentioned it that look, you're not going to go and and fire a coach. You're not going to get rid of a decent coach on your staff if you're not confident that you can hire a much better replacement. And you know he he's reached out and and talked to some guys in the past. And I'm telling you, if he you know if he needs to, he's going to make that switch. And I think we're going to see some changes after the season. And he's going to have some guys lined up where now they know he's not on a hot seat here. He's got an enormous buyout at Florida state. He's got a lot of goodwill built up after the last two years before this one. So, and, and again, the respect in the coaching community means he's going to be able to get very good coaches on his staff when he wants to hire replacements. So yeah, I think he can, I think he can win a, uh, a national title from, from where he's at. All right. Now, again, that doesn't guarantee he will, but I think he can. All right. Um, next mess. Or next uh, uh, question is: uh, Do co- does a coach's message get stale if he stays at an institution after a while, and do players start to tune a coach out? So, the general rule on this is, in my opinion, is no. Uh, at the college level, at the pro level, it happens more easily because you have, you know, longer term contracts, that sort of thing in today's game in college, how would a coach's message get stale when it's 35% of that team is new every year? Those guys haven't heard that message for two, three, four years. So no, that, I don't think that's plausible that, that you're looking at a, a stale message at the, at this level in the current college game. It just doesn't make sense. Now, can some guys tune you out at different points? Does that happen at this level? Absolutely. At times, guys don't buy in for whatever reason in a given team. And I mentioned this in the last episode that, you know, there's a chemistry aspect to this where sometimes the, you know, the whole is less than the sum of the parts. Sometimes it gets, it gets absolutely toxic and I do think that there was some of that with Florida State this this particular year. And, you know, we've seen that. But that's not a matter of getting stale. That's not a matter of a coach needing to change up his message. That's just a matter of of guys deciding that they don't want to hear what the, what that particular coach has to say. And that might be year one. That might be year six. That might be year 10. It doesn't matter. So, like I said, the turnover on rosters is so fast these days that it's just not plausible. Okay. Uh, next one is, um, wouldn't it make more sense to start Chrome and hook as opposed to Glenn? And my thought on that is I think you have to go, go Glenn first and then, then find out what you have with Chrome and hook. If it doesn't really work with, with Glenn, but you know, Glenn's been in your program. He's going to be a third year guy next year. You got to figure out what you have there first. And, you know, I think Luke also came in more raw. I, there's a number of things. I've got some concerns about where he is in terms of, release and accuracy and all that. There's some stuff that's going to have to be developed there. And, 
uh, some other things just in terms of development and decision making and all that, all the things that come in, come with being a, a true freshman. No, I think you've got to go with, uh, with, 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 uh, with, with Brock Glenn on that. Uh, and then, you know, I'm, I've gotten a bunch of questions of, you know, it would, should, should FSU seriously consider moving on from Norvell? And, and, and I think that's crazy talk. That's just absolutely nuts. That's bonkers. Don't listen to anybody who thinks that, that Norvell should be fired. That's, that's crazy. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Okay. Uh, Hi, uh, just your opinion. Uh, Everyone keeps saying Brock Glenn next. Let's face it, he looked pretty bad against Louisville and Georgia. I know Georgia was loaded, but is it clear he's a better option right now than Luke or even Trevor, uh, the runner who might be the closest to a young Travis? So first of all, Trevor's really not an option for uh, reasons uh, at this point uh, that are beyond everybody else's control, uh, beyond Trevor's control as well, beyond the coaching staff's control. So not an option. Uh, not grades, not anything there. I, I think you can kind of read between the lines at that point, you know, ruled everything else out. Um, and then, as I mentioned with Crum and Hoke, I think there's there's other things in play there. The other thing you have to remember, though, is that Brock Glenn got hurt last year and he had barely repped anything in practice through the first three quarters of the year before before that all happened. And then when Jordan Travis got hurt, suddenly he moved up from the number three and, you know, was just working his way back into shape after being hurt and, you know, had gotten no reps, nothing. And, you know, frankly, I thought, I thought once he'd gotten the bowl prep, I thought he looked okay against Georgia. I mean, he made a few nice throws given what was around him, what he was going up against, you know, I I thought he looked fine for a first year guy there. Now as a second year guy, the real question is how much has he stepped forward and developed since then? And I'm not, convinced that Luke is a can't miss quarterback behind him. I think there's some concerns there. So anyway, I think once you, once you consider all that, yeah, I think, I think Brock, Brock should be the the next guy there. Um, So I've also gotten a number of questions of like, if Brock Glenn isn't ready, what does that say about the, you know, about Mike Norvell recruiting him or the coaching acumen of Tokars or, or, Norvell or or anybody else on staff. Freshmen are succeeding at numerous spots in the country right now, like Nebraska, Tennessee, Pitt. We can't seem to find it and develop anyone other than Jordan Travis. So from, from, I think this is important to to point out. First of all, Nebraska and Tennessee are completely different situations because they're each starting probably the number one quarterback recruit in each of their respective classes. And it wasn't really close in either of those you can maybe make a case that Nico was, you know, close with a few others, that there's a handful up there that were in the same level. But coming out, there was a reason that Nico got $8 million in NIL from, from Tennessee to, to go to Tennessee. I mean, that's a whole different tier of budget from what Florida State has invested on that front. Rayola got $2 million a year in NIL from Nebraska, who took him from Georgia by offering him that kind of money and, you know, the fact that he's a legacy at Nebraska. And, you know, that's a probable top five pick in the NFL draft. Those guys are not comparable to Brock Glenn and where they came, came from out of high school. You, you've got to develop a Brock Glenn coming out of high school. Rayola came in pretty much developed. There's no real development that you're doing with him. He came in and he was ready to rock. There aren't many of those guys. Now, look, I'm of the view that if you have to overspend to get one of those guys, if it's possible, you do it. But he better be an absolute can't miss. But you look at what Nico has done for t- for Tennessee by being legitimately worth that $8 million NIL, and yeah, it's it's worth it to them. So does that mean I have no questions about the development of the quarterback position or concerns there? No, that does not mean that. But again, I think you've got to, first of all, give credit where credit is due for Jordan Travis and his development. Uh, I mean, that was not a high, he was not a high recruit in terms of uh, of quarterbacking and, and took a lot of development to get where he got. So you got to give credit there. And then secondly, again, you're dealing with, quarterback recruits that are coming in more raw and that need development in order to reach anywhere near those levels, as opposed to guys who came in, you know, ready-made. And that's, that's just a totally, totally different, uh, situation. 
Okay, I want to thank the next sponsor, and that is Shenandoah uh, Newsma of Shenandoah Real Estate in Chapel Hill, Carborough, the Research Triangle, North Carolina. If you need any real estate, especially listings done, nobody in the state of North Carolina does it better than Shen. Give her a holler. Let her know you heard about her from Unconquered with Doc Staples. Okay. Um, so let's see. Next, uh, next thing here. Up till now, Mike Norvell has not put the emphasis on high school recruiting and has, has instead been willing to build from the transfer portal. And uh, several reports exist about uh, laziness or inability to create re relationships and recruiting in terms of Norvell's staff. Is Norvell finally going to emphasize high school recruiting instead of just relying on the portal from here on? Or is he just going to you know, continue doing what he's done. Whew. Okay. So first thing, I don't think it's true that Norvell has just emphasized the transfer portal over high school recruiting. I've said this before. They've gone portal heavy because they've had to. It's not because they haven't emphasized the need to get players out of high school. It's because they haven't gotten them. And when you don't get them, then you have to replenish from the portal because it's either bring in a bunch of guys in your recruiting class that aren't any good, or you go to the portal and roll the dice with guys that have a chance to actually be good. They've taken the latter. Now, what I do think has to happen is Norvell has to go out and, and, and I think he's a guy that's able to build relationships. He's a guy that does put the work in as a recruiter, but he's going to have to go and get guys on his staff that are, that are closers, right? ABC, always be closing. He's going to have to get some closers. Now, in today's game, relationships basically keep you in the game, and I think money tends to be the real closer. But you've got to get guys that can build those relationships and get guys who, are, who want to come and play for you and play, play for them and play in your program for a discount because they, they've built those relationships. And he's got to hire some of those guys. And you can kind of look at, at Florida State's roster and see where some of that dead weight is in terms of recruiting and say, that guy doesn't seem like he's been able to build any relationships and he's not, he's not getting top-level guys. And they're going to have to figure out which guys they need to kind of part with and figure out who needs to be in those recruiting roles. Now, this is an interesting time in college football in this respect because the, the rules changes on who can actually coach on the field and who can coach in practice, I think have changed how you can do some of this. So in the past, if you were going to move a guy off the field, that meant that that guy was not going to be coaching your team anymore. He was not allowed to coach the players legally, at least. I mean, everybody, virtually everybody kind of broke that, but Norvell and, and his staff really couldn't because they're running open practices essentially with the, with the media. So you couldn't, they couldn't flagrantly break things as, as soon as the, uh, the, the practice closed, like you could at, at certain other places. But what gets interesting is, okay, let's say you, you have a coach heavy staff like they have at Florida state now, where the emphasis is on getting guys who you believe can develop and are are good at, you know, coaching specific technique or whatever. That's good. That's important. But all of a sudden, your analysts and your, uh, you know, your support staff are allowed to coach in practice. They're allowed to coach in the meeting room. They're allowed to coach on the field. The only thing that those guys aren't allowed to do is recruit off campus. So now the real value the place where you want your, the, what you want to do with your actual, you know, 10 guys, 10 assistants who are technically assistants, the thing that you've got to do more than ever now is those guys need to be absolute dynamite recruiters because their job, their primary job is recruiter. And you can actually have, let's say you don't want to get rid of a couple of the guys on the current staff in terms of their coaching acumen and their ability to connect with players and, and make those players better down the line. Let's just say for the sake of argument, you want to do that, but you also know that they need to be better as recruiters. 
Well, then you move him off the field and he becomes the assistant X position coach under the recruiter that you bring in who becomes the main assistant coach there. But you still, now you're just kind of doubling up. Now that gets potentially some toes that get stepped on and all that. And obviously with egos and all that, that matters. But this is something that needs to be thought about. This is something that needs to be considered that right now, in today's game, since your support staff is actually allowed to fully coach, more than ever, you hire recruiters for your primary position coaches. Now, there's some guys that are on the staff. There's a couple of these guys that actually have landed a number of top-level players. They've got top-level commits already. They've been able to build relationships. You don't touch those guys, but I do think that there's some others that you need to seriously look at replacing and just moving off the field if that's what you want to do. So anyhow, okay, I'm going to try to shorten this one as best I can, but this one is a, uh, <laughs> this one is a, a, a sort of a long screed, basically saying that the current approach offensively does not fit the personnel. And I'll just pick up here. This is a finesse offensive personnel. These guys don't have the mental aptitude and the testicular fortitude to drive the football down field play after play 12 or 14 play drives. And you can tell because when they actually have a successful long drive and they're in the red zone, how do they finish? All these guys on offense are finesse guys. Instead of having to hoping to establish a running game that you can play play action off of, they need to extensively take shots down the field vertically and when successful, run your running game RPO and play action off of no huddle. So essentially this, this person is, is arguing that Florida State needs to run the ball off no huddle and then give up the short throws and just try to play the Jeff Bowden offense and... Uh, <laughs> and basically throw up a bunch of verticals over the course of the game. Uh, honestly, um, there's some truth to that in terms of if you can't do anything else, just taking back shoulder shots and vertical shots where you're giving your guys a bunch of 50-50 balls is not the worst idea in the world. Because you're, you know, if you've got guys that can win those, and they've got a couple of them, then you're at least giving yourself self a chance. If you throw three 50-50 balls in a row, you expect to get at least one of them and maybe an interference on another. And so, I mean, how, how long do you have to do this before teams start to try to cover you differently? Because that's just the approach you're taking. It's not honestly the worst idea in the world. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It's not what I'd necessarily advise. There's, you know, you'd prefer to be better at other things, but as this uh, message check uh, concludes, it says uh, the wide receivers are finesse guys. So are the tight ends. Norvell is going to have to finesse these guys down the field. Everything sucks right now. Well, well said. Okay, next one. Uh, one of the things that I love about college football is the nature of a program being like a business and your head coach being the CEO. Every head coach has their own philosophy on how they run the program. From a philosophical approach, what do you think about Mike Norvell tapping into the angst of the fan base and boosters by saying, hey, we're going to strip this down to the studs and rebuild in a sustainable way? The result will be delayed with the goal being a high-end product, uh, essentially saying we're going to suck, but we're going to be better at it. Uh, better for it with the new staff uh, focus on high school recruiting while using the portal, of course, still seeing growth in high school recruiting. I think the fan base and boosters would be behind that and possibly curry more of a favorable conversation nationally, because let's be honest, from a national PR perspective, FSU football has been the butt of a lot of jokes under Norvell, which is unfortunate because he's a dang good coach. Uh, so uh, and then it, con it continues. I'm not much for the empty calories per se, but man, do we need some better PR around this program from the Travis Hunter flip, the playoff snub. And now this year's 0 and 3 start. It just doesn't end. There's a lot there. So first of all, I don't think Norvell could realistically do that and say, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to strip this down to the studs and rebuild. And it's going to take a little bit and it's gonna, we're going to suck for a little bit. And then we'll be back. I, I don't think you can do that, especially in the portal era. You just can't do that. I think you have to, try to sustain a good floor for your program. And then, you know, when the opportunity arises, which was 2023, we talked about this. That was the push your chips into the middle of the table year. When that opportunity arise, arises, you, you invest. But I don't think you can go, we're going to suck for a while, you know, just deal with it. Uh, the other thing is that you can't really recruit high school recruits that you want with the message, we're going to strip down to the studs and stuck and suck for a while. And, you know, honestly, they've been putting energy and resources into high school recruiting, although, again, the re relationship building from the assistants has not been great, has not been good enough. 
but you know, they've just gone to the portal after the fact because they haven't landed those guys. So, and frankly, Travis Hunter hurt this program really, really badly because you add Travis Hunter to the last three years and everything is different. Thing is, if you add Travis, if, if Travis Hunter gets added to this for his sake, everything's different as well. He's so much better off than he is out of Colorado, but that's not how it worked. And that, that really, really set Florida state back and it set Florida state back for three, four years. I mean, one recruit really mattered there. So now you might say, okay, that message would be for the public, not for recruits and all that. But the thing is, the recruits are going to hear this at some point. And so, you know, you might say, okay, well, then your message to the recruits should be early playing time. You know, we're going to suck for a little bit, but you get your early playing time. You can come in and do all of that. You know, isn't that, you know, can't that work as a valid selling point? And here's the problem with that. For the kind of recruits that they're actually going after, for the kind of difference makers that you need to get on your roster to be the kind of team that they want to be, playing time is not actually the best sales pitch for those guys. You've got to persuade those guys that you're going to be playing for championships and that they're going to be playing for championships and that your program will develop them into NFL players better than other programs will. The reason that that playing time is not as big a selling point is every one of these recruits that you're after at this point believes that they're going to get playing time wherever they go. These are guys who've never not been the best player wherever they are. It's going to be a rude awakening for all of these players when they get to college and they realize like, oh my gosh, I'm not the best player. And some of them don't even don't realize that at that point, but they realize, oh, this is different but it takes them getting on campus to have that realization. But all these players believe they're going to play when they go to Georgia. I'm going to commit to Georgia and I'm playing as a true freshman. With the exception of some linemen who are smart enough to know, like it's probably not going to happen. It's probably not the best thing, but everybody or virtually everybody. I mean, some quarterbacks also, you know, might know, you know, Arch Manning knew kind of where, where, what he was walking into. But with, but that's the exception, right? Virtually everybody who signs, who's of that quality is signing with the expectation that they're going to play as a true freshman. And if not as a true freshman, they're going to be basically starting as a redshirt freshman. They all expect that. So if that's your pitch and that's what you have to offer them, they're already like, you're not offering them what they don't already believe they're going to get everywhere. You have to offer them development to the NFL first and foremost, because it's about money. And secondly, championships. Now, ideally, the players you want, you reverse that. So, (laughs) yeah. Okay, this question brought to you by Justin Galloway of Benchmark Mortgage. As always, Justin is going to make sure you are taken care of in a full boutique type experience as a uh, mortgage loan servicer or originator. If you are looking to buy a house in Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, reach out to Justin. Let him know you heard about him from the Unconquered podcast. And look, you're going to be really glad you did. He's going to make it so much so much less painful to buy a house. You want the most painless experience possible. He's the best in the business in those states to do that. Give him a holler. Tell him you heard about him from this podcast. All right. So... Next question, and honestly, I'm not sure I have an answer for this. Um, Can you explain why this offensive line would regress like this? That's a... Honestly, I have been absolutely baffled by this. And I've gotten other questions about, you know, uh, how much... Can we expect to change once Atkins returns to the sideline in this next ball or in this next game? I wouldn't expect a whole lot to change just by the presence of your offensive line coach in the game. Most of the things that you that you're doing in terms of the flaws that are showing up, these are things that you prepare all week. These are things that you work on all year in terms of your fundamentals, your basic communication, you know, just basic things like passing off a, a end tackle stunt. 
just that stuff that like you don't get better at, better at in a game or having a coach coach you in the game. You get better at that stuff during the week and practice. That's when uh, position coaches have their biggest impact. If there is a major change come game day this this week, I, I honestly won't know what to what to think of it. But no, I I don't have a good explanation for why the regression has been so severe. I mean, I thought there was some regression last year in certain respects, but I, I didn't have a great explanation for that other than, you know, I thought at the guard position, the personnel sort of wasn't quite as good as the year before, but I, I look at this and I just don't, you don't see the guys getting taking a step forward that you expected. And some of these guys do look like they've taken a step back. I don't understand it. I don't know what's happened there. I'm not sure we'll ever know. And honestly, I'm not sure the coaching staff, the current coaching staff that's coaching these guys really knows and and has a sense of why that's happened. I mean, Norvell has said that some of the stuff that you're seeing in games isn't even happening in practice. So, you know, when you're normally, what normally happens is something bad happens in practice and you coach it out of guys and then it stops happening in games. But he's, he's saying that some of the stuff that you're seeing in games, is just not happening in practice. So you can't coach it out of guys until it's emerged. And yeah, I honestly, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the source of this is or what the cause of it is. I will say, and this does come back to sort of the beginning of the show to some degree. And we've talked about this for years at different points on this podcast, going all the way back to 2012. A, the quarterback position disproportionately affects everything else. And so you get, you know, a lot of people saying like, was this all just Jordan Travis? Well, no, but also Travis was important. A quarterback who consistently gets you in the right play, checks you into the right, right things, you know, understands the offense, gets you, makes the, the right pre-snap and post-snap decision every time and just gets the ball into the hands of his playmakers, things get so much easier. And that actually, to me, the mark of a good quarterback, and I'm not even talking about a great quarterback. This is bare minimum to be a good quarterback. The mark of a good quarterback is that he makes the routine routine such that an offense just looks like it's it's flowing. And this is where I do think, again, DJ's actual play in terms of what he's done between the whistles has not been the worst thing that this offense has had. But I do think that a quarterback who complemented some of the strengths or, or brought more to the table might have this offense looking completely different. I, I remain convinced that with Jordan Travis, this team is 3-0 and and comfortably. Or with Ward. With Cam Ward, this team's probably comfortably 3-0. and And running it fine because you, you're passing to set up the run. So in some sense, I, I do wonder, and you start to look at the numbers on this, I do wonder how much the offensive line has actually regressed versus it's just gotten revealed because they can't throw the football reliably or do some of the other things that a high-quality quarterback allows you to do. If you look at the yards yards per carry numbers and the yards before contact numbers in games without Jordan Travis, who is the only competent quarterback Florida State has started in the last six years. In the Mike Norvell era, the yards before contact and yards per carry numbers are not good. They look like this year's, but this year's is actually the worst of them in that respect. But they look just like this year's when you take Jordan Travis out of the lineup when he's not playing. So, honestly, I'm not sure there has been, this This might be my answer, I'm not sure that there has been a significant regression. I just think that a quality quarterback has a way of hiding all sorts of other weaknesses on your offense. And this isn't just about escapability or anything like that. This is just 
every offense has its weaknesses. And when you suddenly have to take certain things away last year, teams came in and they were scheming to take away first and foremost, those two enormous wide receivers on the outside. Suddenly it gets, and, and also concerned about Jordan Travis's legs as well. Also, all of a sudden it gets a lot easier to run the football. Even if you're not any better than you are this year on the offensive line or, or elsewhere. And, you know, they had the same kind of problems that showed up at different points last year in in the counter game and in some of those other things. And, you know, I pointed out some fundamental things that I didn't like last year. It's gotten worse, but I do think it's partly because it might just partly be because it's just gotten exposed more and guys are sort of uh, floundering a bit more as opposed to being it being hidden by top level skill talent and a, and quarterback and a quarterback that just makes things look routine and. You know, you make certain things look routine, set up, the, you know, set up the, uh, the the running game well, and, you know, things change. And so much of Mike Norvell's offense is based on essentially pick your poison and scheming a running game up. You know, it's not it's not that he's ever needed a dominant offensive line or anything like that to run the football. Norvell offenses have always been able to run the football. That's why I was so confident they'd be able to do that this year. But the other thing is that Norvell has always managed to have a competent quarterback who can make sure that they're making the defense wrong over and over again schematically so that even if there is a missed block or whatever, you, you're up a gap or you're, you're, you're rushing into adva- advantageous looks. And if not, then you're completing the easy passes on the outside, doing some quick game RPO stuff, taking advantage of some of that stuff. And without that, I think that's I think that's probably the big difference. So I'm not sure that there's been regression in some of those key areas. I think the biggest regression is, and this is where you know you start to think about needing to make a needing to make a change. I think the biggest regression is under center, the guy taking the snaps. And you know, some folks out there, I I, I suppose I should wrap with this. Some folks out there, you know, wondering what in the world with the with the depth chart that there appears to be no change with DJU still listed at the top of the depth depth chart coming into the Cal game. First of all, I do think Brock Glenn is going to play this week, whether he starts the game or not, he's going to play and he's going to have an opportunity to win the job this week. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that for, yeah, I'll just say that I'm confident of that. But the other thing you got to consider is DJU is the, is a guy that's actually played against this Cal defense and this Cal defensive coordinator. And, actually had a a good game against them last year. So if there is a game left on the schedule where it makes sense to actually give DJ a a few cracks at it, this is probably it because he's actually seen these guys. He's played against them and played well against them. So makes sense to put him out there. And, you know, if he, I think if you give him two drives and he goes out there and struggles for those two drives, that's, that's the hook. So I think, I think, if this were me, knowing what he did against them last year, I'm I'm thinking about starting him, giving him two drives and saying, third drive, no matter what, Brock's going to get his go. And that's just what we're going to do. So wouldn't be surprised to see something like that. All right, well, that'll do it for us here. Next time you'll hear about hear from me is going to be the, uh, the preview episode, talking about Cal, Florida State. Another game where, honestly, going into it, I think it's hard to pick Florida state in any game right now. So it's going to be real interesting to see once I've had a chance to break down Cal a little bit more, uh, more in depth, but until then this has been unconquered with doc staples. I'm doc staples. Thanks for listening. If you've been enjoying this podcast, please leave a five-star rating over at Apple podcasts and wherever else you listen to podcasts, post and repost episodes on social media and tell a friend. And if you haven't left a review in a while, do it again. It really does help the visibility of the podcast. Before we go, I'd also like to thank my advertising partners once more. That's EPR Creations, Luis Marquez of Momentum Realty in Jacksonville, Florida, Shenandoah Real Estate in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, Garage Makeovers, the number one garage remodeling company in South Florida, and Justin Galloway of Benchmark Mortgage, serving Florida, Tennessee, and Kentucky. You can also stop by the Unconquered shop at unconqueredpodcast.com where you can buy stickers, pins, magnets, t-shirts, and other swag. And thanks also to all those supporters over at Patreon where I post video analysis and field questions for the podcast. I am especially grateful 
to those above the dynasty level. That is Andrew Garrett, Brian Leininger, Neil Cook, Casey Kidd, Chris Chartrand, Dave Blair, Hector Cartagena, Jack Horton, Jimmy Van, Jonathan Kennedy, Keith Cheney, Lee Caswell, Tyler Kashishke, Vince Calandra, and Burt Bertoldi. You all are far more generous than I deserve. I'm really grateful. Thanks to you all. This has been Unconquered with Doc Staples. I'm your host, Jason Staples. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. I made this. <laughs>